Welcome to day two of the 2020 Naval History Conference, a joint event presented by the U.S. Naval Institute and the Stockdale Center at the U.S. Naval Academy. Our theme this year is sharing the story of the U.S. military through the camera lens. We hope you enjoyed yesterday's sessions and are excited about the day ahead. Thank you to the William M. Wood Foundation for sponsoring this conference. Their support for over 10 years has allowed us to bring this important and timely content to the midshipmen and the broader Naval Institute community. Today, we have another incredible lineup of speakers, and I'll throw it over to midshipman Eddie Ramirez to get us started. Have a great day, and thanks for tuning in. What? Thank you, Admiral Daly. My name is Midshipman 4th Class Eddie Ramirez, and you're watching the third of our six webcasts for our virtual event. This morning's panel is entitled, From Script to Screen, The Partnership Between Hollywood and the Department of Defense. Today's panelists will provide insights into this important relationship and their role in the process. Our moderator is Dr. Sean Baker, the Assistant Director for the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership here at the U.S. Naval Academy, and teacher of one of the most popular classes on the yard, Philosophy at the Movies. Our distinguished panel today includes David Iyer, Rear Admiral Dennis Moynihan, and Lieutenant Colonel Glenn Roberts. Let me kick it over to Dr. Baker, who will introduce you to our panel. Take it away. Thank you, Eddie. I'm very glad to uh, chair this panel. I'm very excited to get started. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Eddie is uh, a plebe here. He's also a member of the Ethics Debate Team, another activity I do here at the Naval Academy. And he, he uh, along with the other midshipmen on that team, make my life very easy as a coach. Very often, all I have to do is sit back and, and let them discuss. Uh, so thank you, Eddie. Appreciate that. And uh, before we get started, I need to take care of a few housekeeping items, for lack of a better term. Uh, in case you need them, there are some tips for your best viewing experience under the resource list uh, here on the page you're looking at. And uh, also, just to let you know, we're going to split the time roughly half and half here between a discussion between us, the panelists here, and uh, uh, probably what will be the best part of the experience, Q&A uh, uh, toward the end of the session. And uh, also, uh, an amazing uh, tip of the hat to the people uh, producing this, Don Brown and Elite Studios, uh, a uh, a recorded version of this will be due or will be available at the same link that you use to, to get to this uh, feed uh, roughly 24 hours from now. Uh, so be sure to check back anytime to review what you've seen and we'll have a, we have a fruitful session here. Now, in order to get started, um, I would like to go around the horn uh, with all of our uh, participants and have them introduce themselves. I have some very nice introductions here that were written up by Don, but I think uh, it would probably be, be a better idea to have everybody here um, tell us about themselves and their connection, not only with the film industry, but obviously with the military. So I will start with our uh, writer, director, producer, David Ayer. Uh, David, could you uh, tell us, uh, give us a bio? Tell us about yourself. Absolutely, thank you. Um, um, I'm a uh, writer, producer, director, uh, and a uh, former uh, Navy submarine uh, sonarman. Served on a fast attack during the Cold War. Uh, bipolar world, kind of missed that a little bit. Uh, and, and somehow transitioned into this very unusual career field. Thank you. A uh, very interesting backgrounder for you. It's, uh, you were, went, it's a great connection. Went, from service into the film industry. So you've got a, a unique background there and I'm looking forward to asking you some questions about that. And also looking at, uh, at a clip you've provided for us from one of your earlier films, U571. All right, thank you. Um, uh, Admiral Moynihan, Dennis Moynihan, can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm uh, Denny Moynihan. I was uh, Chief of Information from 2009 until uh, 2012. Um, currently, I'm, uh, I'm serving in the corporate world. I work at uh, Quest Diagnostics. I was in the Navy for 26 years, and when I was on active duty, any time Admiral Daly called, I always dropped what I was doing, and I find myself still doing that in my, in my next 
my next life. So I'm happy to be here, Dr. Baker. And uh, David, nice right. to meet you. Nice to meet you, sir. You too, Denny. Thank you. And Quest Diagnostics always does my blood work, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we appreciate that, panelist. Dr. Baker. Thank you very much. <laughs> Our third panelist is Colonel Glenn Roberts. Uh, works with the DOD. He's got an unenviable position, I think, being kind of the uh, go-to guy when the entertainment industry uh, wants to deal with any branch of the service, it looks like. Uh, but before that, uh, he did. He was a entertainment liaison officer in Los Angeles with the Air Force. Colonel, can you introduce yourself as well? Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Lieutenant Colonel Glenn Roberts, retired, uh, now a civilian working at DOD. Um, did about uh, 23 years on active duty as a public affairs officer uh, for the Air Force. And uh, my last four years on active duty were in Los Angeles, leading the entertainment liaison office um, with, uh, you know, uh, working alongside our colleagues in the Navy, Army, and Marine Corps offices, as well as our Coast Guard uh, friends. Um, all co-located right there in Los Angeles. Great, thank you. All right, guys, so as you can see, uh, we've got a, a very interesting collection of people here. We've, we have on the one side, the entertainment industry, somebody that has previous experience with the Navy, it's awesome. And on the other side, the uh, military. And um, as everybody probably knows, uh, taking part in this and watching, uh, there's been a long history of uh, uh, connection between the military and the entertainment industry, going back to a film called Wings, which was, the, I believe, the first Academy Award winner. I did not know this about uh, Air War. Um, so what I'd like to do in the balance of our time, guys, is, uh, and please uh, try and uh, um, not uh, give me an eye roll when I say this, uh, that goes for the audience too, but I, I, I'd like to, if I can, um, uh, uh, get some war stories, sorry, just couldn't resist, uh, about <laughs> this working relationship. Is uh, Reviewing material that I've looked at, uh, read, read about to each one of you, this looks like it is a lot of work. And there are a lot of moving pieces in terms of uh, objectives and uh, criteria on both sides of the uh, mm -hmm. process here and i'm kind of curious to get that insider's perspective from you guys on uh, uh what this partnership involves and how how important since this is a history um conference how important accuracy is um, mm -hmm. not only in terms of historical accuracy but i would say technical accuracy because I'm looking at a list of films everybody's worked on, and uh, Colonel, you were kind enough, Glenn, you were kind enough to provide a, a, a long list of films, and I'm, I'm very impressed with the, the breadth of genre in those films. Uh, everything from what you would expect, movies having to do with military operations and military life per se, to superhero films. We've got Iron Man 1 and 2, um, and, and other films like that. So I'm, I'm really curious to see uh, uh, what is what all is involved in this and what all is involved in the uh, decision-making process, whether or not to get involved with a film project. So I know that's a long-winded preface. Um, I would like to start with Mr. Ayer and uh, ask you, um, you know, once you've decided on a film project that has something to do with the military, uh, either tangentially or directly, um, what kinds of steps do you have to go through in order to get the cooperation of the DOD or and the several branches of the uh, military? And could you step us through some of that and maybe give an example? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's interesting because, uh, you know, you're talking about uh, you know, the institution of the military, which, uh, you know, has to tell its story in the correct way. And in my industry, you know, we're commercializing stories, we're commercializing narratives in order to sell them to a broader audience. And so, uh, you know, unfortunately, it's not like the past where a lot of directors, a lot of people in the industry had uh, served in the military and were very familiar with the culture. And what I run into 
is a lot of producers, a lot of my colleagues, because they haven't, uh, you know, lived in the military or had those experiences, don't necessarily understand the culture or the requirements of the military or how uh, detailed and specific things can be. Um, you know, I think one of the requirements is uh, the opportunity to kill lines in a script, let's say, if something is, is inappropriate or misrepresents uh, the services, it, it shouldn't be in a movie that DOD supports. And, and so part of the initial process is submitting the script, reviewing it. Uh, you know, the public affairs shops are, are, are really outstanding. Every PAO I've worked with has, has really understood both um, how to navigate DOD, but also how to navigate Hollywood, which can be equally complex and Byzantine. Um, you know, one of the uh, great experiences I had was on Fury. Uh, we worked with the Army, and I got to bring the actors to uh, NTC, and they got to meet the armor community as it is today. And, you know, as, as those in the military know, uh, history, legacy, stories are all part of everyone's journey through the military, you feel very connected to history. And it, it was great for them to see that tankers are tankers kind of regardless of time and place. And they were really welcomed. Uh, you know, the same thing with um, uh, other projects I've worked on. Uh, it's, it's just been incredible to get support from DOD, but it's, you're not gonna get everything you want and, and you have to know what to ask for. Great, thank you very much. Uh, on on that uh, note, uh, I was wondering um, how much emphasis uh, the DOD does put on that, um, uh, for lack of a better term, that uh, over oversight on the script. Mm -hmm. uh, curious to see, because I mean, you're right, naturally, uh, uh, DOD and uh, services want to present themselves well, certainly and certainly don't want to be misrepresented in films. So uh, I'm curious uh, as to the amount of back and forth there is on, on scripting. So that's a question not only for you, David, but also for uh, Denny and Glenn. Um, Denny, uh, could you give us some insight on that uh, uh, aspect of the interaction, script writing? Well, I. I think a common theme here through this entire hour, Dr. Baker, is going to be collaboration um, and meeting in the middle. Um, folks like David may come to DOD or to the service um, with a script, and we, we want to work with them, um, but it also has to be credible to the audience on the inside. And we all want the same thing. So there, there may be a script that starts at one place, um, it, it needs to be credible, but by the other, on the other side, it, it also needs to be somewhat entertaining. So a lot of folks who are producing movies, they're not there to make historical documentaries. So yes, it has to be credible, but there also has to be a little bit of entertainment to it as well. And, uh, you know, to the folks on the military side, they, they've got to realize there's, there's some give and there's some take, and you have to understand where where you're willing to give and where you where you need to take, especially when it comes to uh, script writing. Good, thank you, uh, Colonel Roberts. Could you pitch uh, uh, in there? Sure. Uh, I think one of the big things that the best place to start with this is to explain kind of why we do what we do, um, and that's really to inform and, and educate the public on the roles and missions of the Department of Defense. So that's kind of where it starts, right? When we look at a script, we are really asking the question, does this inform and, edu and, and educate the public more than entertain? You know, my aspect is uh, entertainment's great and we want it to entertain, but our real core mission is to inform and educate. So when we're looking at a script, we're looking to see ultimately, you know, does it line up with the core values of the, of the military and the services, you know, for the Navy, honor, courage, and commitment, for the Air Force, integrity, service, and excellence. Um, you know, that, that's really what we look for. And we're not out to change their narrative. We're not out to change the story. We go to great pains to make sure that filmmakers understand that we're not out there to actually change their story or to impact it. But we just want to assist in adding, you know, a meaningful portrayal, an accurate portrayal, and a credible portrayal. And so that's kind of where it goes for us. Is it goes back to core values. Some we know off the top we're just not going to be able to support, and that's okay. 
Um, and we're always available for cursory support, even if we don't support officially. Um, offline, we have, uh, you know, our folks are always willing to sit down and work with screenwriters, even if we know we can't formally assist in the production. We're there to answer questions. We're there to help guide, you know, here's a uh, script uh, as far as dialogue would go, as far as settings and props, you name it. Um, I mean, I think they go through the entire gamut. But ultimately, it all comes back to informing and educating the public and making sure that the script aligns with our core values. Um, and if it, as, uh, as the Admiral said, there's a lot of collaboration involved, a lot of back and forth. It's not even really a form of negotiation. It's never been anything other than cordial. Um, that I've seen, but it's, uh, it's a fantastic opportunity. And most often the screenwriters or the directors and the producers that we work with are, uh, we have great relationships and it's uh, very much a give and take. And the last thing I would say is it's okay if you have someone who does not, um, who is not trying to, um, who is portrayed as a villain in their active duty. That does not automatically disqualify us as long as the overall theme comes back to, for us, it upholds the core values of that service. Great, thank you very much. Uh, on that, uh, on that, uh, following up on that theme, uh, have you ever had, uh, and this is for you, Colonel Roberts, have you ever had a case where, or DO, has DOD ever had a case where maybe there's more than one service involved in uh, the process of working with a filmmaker and they have differing opinions on whether or not uh, there should be cooperation with that with that production. Uh, have you ever had uh, anything like that happen and how do you mediate that? We have and in yeah. fact I've had that um, there was a, a movie I was involved with probably back in 2015, 2016 that, uh, that initially started out with two services um, one of the services decided um, for a variety of reasons that it just wasn't a narrative that they wanted to, to portray among their service. Um, we felt at, that the Air Force at the time, it was still portraying a positive Air Force portrayal. It wasn't a negative portrayal of the other service. It just wasn't offering them uh, a positive portrayal. Um, and they're a very small office, and they had to kind of uh, determine among what resources they have available, and they opted to... Uh, to um, not support the, uh, the production, but it went through uh, anyway with the support of the Air Force. That happens from time to time. Um, again, as we said, it, it's always, you know, we work very, very closely together, all of the services. I can't say enough the amount of teamwork, and I'll point to the success story of Lone Survivor. Um, you know, the story um, of the Navy SEAL, uh, true life story, um, that was filmed on an Air Force base in Albuquerque, New Mexico, with Army assets, to represent a Navy SEAL. So I think there's lots of great success stories. So all three services were involved um, in the production of that. I, I will tell you the majority of movies and productions that we do do involve more than one service. Um, if you look at Michael Bay's Transformer movies, um, I think we worked on all four of those. Um, most of them have multiple aspects of military service in them. Um, and so we go to Army bases, we go to Air Force bases, um, we have the portrayal of, of Navy in there throughout. So um, it's a fantastic partnership. And I, I would tell you, as again, as the Admiral said, the collaboration is something that you just can't uh, footstop enough that is actually uh, integral to the success of, of what we do in informing and educating the public. Thank you. And uh, it must be an unenviable task on your part to coordinate all of this. You, you've got people like Dave on one side and various services on the other, uh, trying to keep it all organized and everybody happy. Um, David, that brings me back to you. Um, so uh, you were generous enough to provide us with a clip from one of your one of your earliest uh, efforts, a movie called U571. Uh, we'd like to show the clip, but before we do, um, I. I I'm curious as to uh, what your thought process was leading up to the scripting for that uh, film and what your objectives were in uh, producing that film. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's an interesting project. The, uh, when I was hired, uh, you know, I was a junior screenwriter. It was really uh, one of my first films, uh, Jonathan Mostow. 
had written a, a really solid script. Um, now with U571, obviously there's a lot of controversy because uh, it depicts the capture of the, of the uh, naval enigma by US forces, which actually didn't happen until 1944. It was captured, I believe, in, in early uh, 42, 41, 41 by uh, Lieutenant uh, David Baum, who I actually met uh, and was an advisor on the film. Um, it wasn't my lane necessarily to, to change that aspect of it, but what I felt I brought to the table was tone, culture, character. Um, you know, my grandfather uh, was a 30-year uh, officer, retired submariner, served in World War II, and, and so I grew up around the stories and the lore. And I wanted to represent the nature and character of, of, the, of the men that went to sea on, on, these, uh, on these boats and, and fought on our behalf. Um, and, and as far as the clip goes, as, uh, you know, as, as Glenn mentioned, this idea of uh, cursory support's really important. So I'd, I'd written the script, I'd written the scene that we're about to see, given it to Harvey Keitel, uh, who's an 800-pound gorilla. And, and again, as a junior screenwriter, I don't have a lot of weight to throw around. And he <laughs> wasn't quite sure that it was accurate. He wasn't quite sure that uh, the dialogue made sense or was realistic. He's playing an old salty Navy chief, and that's how I wrote it. It's 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 old school deck plate seamanship there, and uh, the Navy uh, let him go on a cruise on uh, 688 out of Groton, and he's in the cruise mess, and he starts running lines, and and he says one of the uh, you know one of the junior enlisted sailors there said that that's my chief. That's exactly how he talks, and I think then he kind of understood. Uh, a little bit about the culture, but I, I think it is important to represent, um, you know, the people I, I, as much as it is sort of the tech, technical components and equipment. But uh, if you'd like to, let's let's take a look at that clip. Yeah, thanks, Don. This whole thing is crazy. I'm just gonna lazo with a typewriter. It's not a typewriter. Mm -hmm. Hell, it ain't. It's got buttons like a typewriter. Yeah, well, it's not. Yeah, well, it's whatever it is. I say it's crazy to get us those kill Maybe says it's important. It's important. Maybe says it's more important than you, him, me. Fine. We're gonna die trying. That ain't crazy. That's our job. Well, what I don't seem to understand, Chief. So how come you're not in charge? He's got about his dog room was kicking Tyler out of the Navy anyway, and everybody here knows that. You stole that shit right now, sailor. Lieutenant Tyler is your commanding officer, and we respect that man as such. Do you understand? Oh, shit. My pop was a fisherman. And this old 60 footer, he'd, he'd run all over the Gulf. Noisy two stroke diesel. Rotten to the gunnels, that thing. I, mean, I could scrub that deck three times a day and it still stunk like fish. But I swore I'd never skip her a boat like that, Chief. I saw myself standing on the bridge of a battleship. Real sea captain. Mr. Tyler, permission to speak freely? Of course, Chief. This is the Navy. 
where a commanding officer is a mighty and terrible thing. A man to be feared and respected, all-knowing, all-powerful. Don't you dare say what you said to the boys back there again, I don't know. Those three words will kill a crew, dead as a death charge. You're the skipper now, and the skipper always knows what to do, whether he does or not. All right. Thanks, David. It's a great clip. Uh, it does really drive home a point I think you mentioned uh, and getting back to kind of the theme of my questioning, I guess, it's uh, there's, there's more than one aspect of accuracy that uh, uh, these the films are driving at. And as I watched that particular film, I was aware of the uh, departures from history in it. But I was also very, very much aware of uh, the effort you put toward displaying accurately the relationship between a young and relatively inexperienced officer and his chief, as well as the people under him. And I like the story arc in this story. You see this character to, uh, gain that trust by the end of the film uh, in the process of making a, a, a few uh, wrenching decisions that, that were life you know, where lives literally hang in the balance. Uh, I think you did a great job with that in this film. And uh, also, it's just a good ripping yarn, to use a, a phrase that uh, our British friends would use, um, in that, you know, they're, uh, I'll let you uh, tell a little bit, bit, a bit about the story um, in terms of it being a good ripping yarn. Uh, the, uh, the aspect where they're taking that submarine, that German submarine, um, could you tell us a little bit about that storyline without getting us too far off on a tangent? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think uh, they end up capturing the boat by accident, uh, or, you know, or they just wanted the Enigma, and then obviously they're uh, they're in an S boat, which is an older class, uh, gets sunk. Uh, there were no uh, submarine on submarine actions, I believe, in World War II, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's. For me, it's, you know, on, on my boat, you know, and if, if you know the submarine community, it's a little bit different in the sense of uh, it's, it's very, it's very close. It's very, uh, I don't, I don't want to say informal because it can be incredibly formal, but there's a, a navigation of relationships between officers enlisted and, and the goat locker that, um, is, is a bit closer and, and interconnected than say on a, on a larger command. And there's uh, incredible mentorship on a submarine. And you see, uh, you know, JOs come to the boat and how they get taken under the wings of the chiefs. It's really the chiefs that educate them in a lot of ways. Obviously the officers, the ward, the ward room takes care of themselves, but you know, the chiefs as we know are the backbone of the Navy. and. You know, for me, it was important to that scene uh, that he walked in with coffee. That's that's where the real discussions happen over a cup of coffee. Um, and and at the end of the day, it, it it's that human aspect. And I think Hollywood has a hard time understanding or reconciling uh, the the humanity of service people against uh, the requirements of the mission. And you know, we go into harm's way and you know, servicemen can be asked to do things that risk their lives. There's, there's inherent danger in what they do. And that idea of, 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 of courage, you know, one of the core values of the Navy is, is facing danger and getting the job done no matter the consequences. And, and it's a key part of the culture and a key part of, of, of Naval history. And it's just something that I really wanted to represent. And you did a good job. And I, I, it's interesting that Lone Survivor was brought up. So Denny and Glenn, I had wondered what input you had with regard to uh, the efforts that are uh, put forth, people you recruit on the DOD end to give uh, the necessary kind of, as it were, instruction in that day-to-day -day life uh, that Dave's talking about uh, for script writing purposes and training up of actors. Um, can you give us any good 
use that phrase again, war stories uh, related to that process. Admiral, you want to go first? In the case of Lone Survivor, um, Peter Berg was the uh, the producer for that for that film, and Peter knew all of the families incredibly well um, before the movie. So there there wasn't a lot of of prep work that needed to be done on our end to help Peter be able to tell that story. He had deep knowledge, but I, I would like to follow on something that David was saying. Um, and if you're a midshipman or if you're on active duty and, and you're watching this thing, there are two words that, that I'd like to touch on. It's access matters. David needs access to tell the story. And what he said about Harvey going on a 688, do you think Harvey could have nailed that line that he just showed us if he didn't live that experience, however temporarily? So if you're on active duty and somebody comes to your, your boat or your ship like that, it it's about access because it helps David tell the story. And on the back end, it matters. It matters to the credibility of David's final product. But it also matters out here in places like New Jersey because – a good story is sometimes the only touch that a young man or woman will have with the Navy or a young parent whose mom, you know, whose kid comes to them and says, hey, I'm thinking about joining the Navy. David's the one that tells that story. So the more we can give him access, his finished product really and truly matters. And I know it's a lot of hard work sometimes, but the final product, when done well, it really makes a difference. So. Glenn, over to you. Oh, thank you, Admiral. Um, I would tell you that, you know, for us, the, the beauty of this job is we get to work with um, virtually every aspect of filmmaking, right? We get to work for everything from locations to wardrobe to props to um, script to you, you name it. Um, and I think the best ones that, that I've seen or been a part of or heard about are the times when we're invited into the writer's rooms. Um, I think that the writer is, you know, it's really all about the story and everyone is important. Everyone has an important aspect of, of the film, but I, I can't overemphasize to me. I personally believe that the writer is the most important person um, that you, that you will deal with. Um, and the best ones that I've seen, we have been invited into several uh, production, uh, you know, several movies uh, where we're able to sit in with the writers in the writer's room in the early stages um, and if not, uh, the ones who are open to uh, general suggestion, right? We, we don't insist always that, hey, you ha he has to say this or she has to say that. But um, as David, you know, indicated earlier, it, it's about credibility and authenticity. And I think no one does that better than the folks that are, that are on active duty. So um, certainly, you know, our office is very small. We're not subject matter experts in, in everything out there. So we reach out frequently. I've got a very thick Rolodex of people that we reach out to, all the services do, um, of folks that we reach out to that are operators, that are the people um, that are doing the work and that know this best. Um, we, you know, one that comes to mind, Anne Hathaway was doing a play. It was a Broadway play called Grounded about, about an Air Force, um, a female Air Force uh, F-16 pilot who becomes a drone pilot. And we took her up to Nellis Air Force Base, and she spent um, a day with uh, just surrounded with female fighter pilots um, from 7 in the morning till 6 at night. And the feedback that we had was just an incredible transformative experience where she was able to understand, um, you know, and experience firsthand kind of how that worked. Uh, we did that as well with Captain Marvel, with Brie Larson, um, out at Nellis Air Force Base as well, uh, training for her role for Captain Marvel. She flew with the Thunderbirds. Um, she was able to do a lot of different things, spent some time with Brigadier General Jeannie Levitt uh, of the Air Force. And we think that that, you know, helped tell a great story of, uh, of a courageous Air Force pilot. So um, anytime we can get involved with the writing uh, or to help with credibility and authenticity, um, that's definitely what we're here for. Great. Thank you, Carl. Uh, well, that uh, we are at the 9.30 mark, folks, so uh, uh, I'm under instructions to start Q&A here, and I can tell you right now, 
we have a whole bunch of <laughs> excellent questions. So I am going to uh, scroll through them and hit as many as I can uh, in the balance of the time we have here. So uh, the first one um, comes from Ken Campbell. And this is for you, Dave. It says, uh, uh, many of your films feature the police and in some, as in uh, the film End of Watch, have explicitly former military. Mm -hmm. Do you mm -hmm. feel there is a natural overlap in the type of stories that can be told by both groups or is it a consequence of other factors? And I don't want any, <laughs> And he, he ends up saying yes. And I don't care what anyone says, I liked Suicide Squad. <laughs> Copy so, that. Uh, take that one, Dave. <laughs> uh, well, obviously, you know, there are similarities between uh, military and law enforcement and, you know, uh, uniform services, uh, facing danger, uh, the idea of service, uh, you are sort of sacrificing uh, a lot of normal things in civilian life in order to do these jobs. Um, there's there's a common culture uh, and discipline aspect, the hierarchy, the ranks, the structure, and, and a lot of uh, former military folks definitely end up in law enforcement. But it's, it's like anything, it's, it's important for me to represent, you know, the, the culture uh, to honor the people who wear the badge or honor the people that wear the uniform. Uh, and it, it is funny, I do use, you know, a lot of uh, veterans in, in my work. I bring them on as technical consultants. I make them into actors, you know, throw them in front of the camera and give them lines and watch them squirm. Uh, you know, it's, it's that thing that, you know, as a veteran, I was given incredible opportunities. And it's... It's I like to pay it forward. You know, an example of that is on on Fury. You know, my my lead tech, uh, lead military advisor, uh, Kevin Vance, is a you know former member of the Navy Special Warfare community. And it might seem counterintuitive to put a guy like that in charge of a World War II tank movie, but I knew I made the right call when he showed up with the training plan, and it was a binder that thick. Um, you know, you know how those guys do it. They they really dirt dive and and really plan. And uh, it was kind of the perfect person to do all the complex organization. Great, that's a that's great. I have another good question uh, from Jen's son. This one probably is best for Glenn or Denny to uh, address. Uh, she says, "Good morning, all. I was wondering whether or not there has been a scenario when a military branch reached out to screenwriters with their own narrative, and are the permissions the same to create this kind of movie? And do screenwriters have the same enthusiasm to work on a military-produced narrative?" Good question. Or set of questions. Glenn, you want to take that one? Sure, Admiral, thank you. So I would say for us, we have there's two aspects of our job. It's to project and protect the image of the Department of Defense and the men and women in the Department of Defense in the entertainment sphere. So for us, um, the project part, you know, we take the protect part that speaks for itself, right? We're looking out for the integrity, but the project part, we don't ever pitch. Um, we don't have an active pitch where I will call a studio and say, hey, have you guys thought about this? Um, we do often, you know, engage in, um, in our relationships with the studios and our relationship with specific directors, writers, producers. Um, when we're on a project, it seems often one leads to another. Um, and, you know, I, we will give gentle nudges or recommendations. We'll say, hey, have you looked at, you know, for instance, the Space Force is brand new. So this is a new aspect. Um, of, you know, we don't have any Space Force projects yet. So when I talk to people, I say, hey, have you thought about maybe looking at something in the realm of space? But really, um, it's, it's nothing beyond that. Uh, we are not in the business of pitching films um, or narratives, but we are certainly in the, uh, in the business of assisting to make that film better. And it's also important to note that that's at no cost to the taxpayer, right? So that was just one last point I wanted to make was that when we do work with uh, with filmmakers and studios, they pay for all the associated costs. 
so the job that we do is we don't uh, charge them for uh, any advice or counsel or anything else that we provide. Um, assets, if they're training assets and they're happening already, they're certainly allowed to come film those at no cost. Um, but if they are asking for us to generate a mission or to utilize a long-term, uh, a long-term asset, then um, certainly we charge the, uh, the studios for that cost. That good, thank you. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Pleasure. You want to have Go a good ahead. example of the that that give and take and the no charge um, when uh, we were having initial discussions about Captain Phillips, um, the requirements that were asked of of the producers and the director were, we need five DDGs and a big deck amphib in Europe for four weeks, um, and at the time I think we had one or two ships overall in the Mediterranean, so that was the ask and where we came to was, hey, we can give you most of that, but it's off the coast of Norfolk because it's a training exercise. Um, and it worked and it worked very well, but that's a great example of it. it it's at no cost um, and the relationship that you need to have on both sides to, to make it really work. Good, thanks. And here, here's an interesting question. It's more, uh, more simply a technical question, but it's one that certainly comes to mind every time I watch any any film that has to do with uh, the military and warfare. And, it, and this one comes from Ron Birdie. He says, I'm always fascinated by the sets and the battle scenes. How in the heck do you find dozens of tanks or build what looks like a destroyed inner city? And I would, I would uh, aim a similar question to Dave. How the heck do you find the appropriate submarines for a film dealing with World War II. I'm, I'm, I'm always fascinated by this aspect of film. Well, uh, you got to build them. Uh, we built the uh, uh, S-boat set. Uh, you know, we sh shot it in Italy at Chinachita Studios. And I mean, you want to talk about old world craftsmen. Um, what they did with those sets is absolutely incredible. Um, uh, the production designer was uh, Gertz Weidner, who uh, did Das Boot. So he had that experience in, in constructing uh, a, this, the submarine sets. We built the U-boat set, I think, 10% uh, oversized because you can't detect the size difference on camera, but your hatches and, and passageways are, are that much bigger, so you can actually move crew and equipment through um, in, in a better regards. We actually found a, a Type 7 periscope in a scrapyard in Poland. So it, it wow. was kind of fascinating to watch all these bits and bobs from all over Europe sort of coalesce onto the set. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, it, it sort of hit that, wait a second, I got these actors and they're not watch standers. You know, they, they've never stood at battle stations watch. They've never gone to see in a submarine. And we had to train them how to look like a submarine crew, how to operate like a submarine crew. And there was a realization that the gauges, dials, and indicators weren't automated. And they have to follow the choreography of the scene. You know, if you dive, the depth gauge has to move as you change course, rudder indicators, all that stuff. Uh, you know, I brought it to the attention of the director, hey, this, this is going to be an issue uh, for continuity on, on camera. And the next day, there was a gentleman wiring up electro servos to every single gauge, plugged them into a computer, and then we figured out the correct scripting of the gauges so that it was repeatable. And when you cut into the scene at any point, uh, the gauge performance will be correct. And, and that's, that's the level of detail that, that you, I believe you have to get into to accurately represent uh, war fighting. Yes, that's, that's, that's incredible. Um, I have another one. This was uh, this is directed to you, Dave. But I think uh, uh, Glenn and Denny, you could probably uh, answer this one as well. It comes from Nicholas Clark, and he says, "How often does classified or privileged information become a point of conflict between Hollywood and the military?" You know, making a film, and have you yourself ever experienced anything like that in your career? Wow. Um, I mean, if if you've had a clearance, you're you're pretty well trained on on go no go areas and 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 security. 
Um, and, and obviously there's different kinds, you know, there's TTP, there's things like that. So uh, there are things that uh, you break a little bit so that you're not revealing uh, anything you should to a potential adversary. Um, I think, it, you know, it's obviously incredibly important to, to protect a lot of uh, information out there. Um, and at the end of the day, you can kind of fudge things for the audience because uh, they don't necessarily know the truth of the situation. Uh, so as long as it feels accurate, um, you know, I think you're pretty good to go. Good. Um, uh, Glenn or Dennis? Sure. Uh, for me, when I read a script to see if we can support, there's four things that I look for each time. Um, and the first is security. Uh, so security meaning classification or just meaning is it giving away, as David said, you know, TTP, tactic, techniques, procedures. Um, you know, we want to be credible and authentic, but just as David noted, it's, it's not something that uh, we want to share with adversaries. So we keep a close watch on the security aspect. Um, we also look for accuracy. Is it accurate? Is, does it portray it in an authentic way? Um, policy. Is it within the Department of Defense policy? Is what's being portrayed, does it show that we're in policy? And again, it can go outside the lines as long as it upholds in the end the policy and the integrity of the service. And then last is propriety. Is it, is it proper? Is it the right thing to do? Does it really portray uh, military in the right way? Um, and so, again, when I'm reading those four things, security, accuracy, policy, and propriety, and security is at the, at the head of that list. And so I'd tell you, when we read scripts, there's times we go, wow, that's really close to something. Um, and most often when you talk to the, the writers and the directors, um, you're able to, uh, to work that out, just as, as David said, especially if they're looking to partner with the Department of Defense, they understand. And uh, I've never heard of a situation where um, it was anything other than a cordial discussion and uh, usually gets resolved very quickly. Great. Thank you. Um, I have another question here, and I'm going to add just a little bit to it. This is an interesting one. Can you give an example, if there is one, where the DOD has uh, killed a project, not just not just not participated, but stopped production? And I guess my my follow-on question for that is, if there isn't one where there is killed, where a project was killed, um, is there a good example of one that? cooperation ceased because of the content. So I can't give any examples. Uh, I'll start. Think that, Go ahead. Uh, please do. Please do. Um, I think both the previous question ties into this question, and that is, you know, Glenn, Glenn laid out the review process. Um, but behind that, there's also the who are you working with process and getting to know uh, the people that are behind the project. And if you do both of those things, you'll work with people who are not looking to endanger national security. They're not looking to get anybody hurt. Uh, so no, I'm not aware of any projects that we had to kill, um, but that's also because I think we had great people like Glenn and Phil Strube before him. And in Los Angeles, we had our own people who, they have, they have conversations and they have relationships on the front end so that you don't get to these kind of problems on, on the back end. There's, there's plenty of common ground you can find to do something um, that is both entertaining and, and is credible. Great, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, I have one more. This is an interesting one too. Uh, and this is a question for uh, you, Admiral Moynihan. How does the military deal, and this is Roger Stahl, by the way, uh, providing this question. How does the military deal with the suggestion of war crimes? I'm thinking about Marcus Luttrell's book where the CO suggests they kill the captured goat herders. This suggestion goes missing from the film. Uh, this change seems like it compromises the principle of authenticity. What do you think of that? Um. Look, it, it gets to 
again, a lot of the things that, that we talked about, does it reflect well on the military? Can it be used for recruiting? And can people like David, and in this case, Peter, still tell a credible story? So is everything that ever happened in that situation reported on, including the movie? No, it's not. Um, but I think that's okay, because in the end, you got a very credible product um, that certainly the service, I think, was proud of, and I think that Peter was proud of as well. So every detail, absolutely not, for all the reasons that we talked about before, um, but I don't have a problem with that. Okay, good. Um, and I have a question for the whole panel. Um, uh, it's kind of a personal reflection, I guess. Um, I'm thinking of the film Full Metal Jacket, mm. Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket. If you ask me uh, to cite one film that I've found to be the most disturbing in terms of how it does portray a service, I'm thinking that's the one for me. Uh, I think it, for my gut reaction to the thing is I've watched it several times. Uh, the portrayal of the, the Marine Corps is, is harsh. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what all of you would would do if you were given a, a hypothetical situation were you given a script that strikes you the same way uh what would the uh, process be like uh, to uh, work with the script writers or the producers or whoever it is that's offered this up as a, a potential story to tell uh, uh what would you how would you go about addressing their need for authenticity, which I suppose is what Kubert thought he was doing, uh, with a need to be, as it were, a bit more fair to the service in question. Um, I know that's a very broad question. Anybody want to take that? If, if I may, um, what I've found, uh, I've had scripts cross my desk with uh, negative portrayals of, of the military. And what I've found is that it's, it's not necessarily one scene or one element, but an overall disposition that feels very, um, uh, you know, negative towards the services. And uh, sometimes you can kind of recognize an underlying agenda uh, beneath it. And for me, it's just not something I'm going to do. Um, it's not something I'm interested in portraying. It's, it's you know, I've, I've had, you know, personal skin in the game and again you know my family history and and just knowing so many awesome active duty people and uh, and and it's a great community and you know the military is one of the few places in our society now where values are important ethics are important bearing is important um you know developing yourself being a good person being held to higher standards. And, you know, I think that's something that should be honored and and, and not bilged. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Denny? I think when we're, we, I think when the military is approached with a, with a project, um, there's two things they need to think through. The first is, how can we get to yes? And you always want to try to do that. But then you also have to think about what are your principles and what are you not willing to stand for? And sometimes you can't get there because it that project is not in line with what you stand for. And you have to be willing to, to walk away. So you try to get the yes, but you have to be willing to walk away. And maybe that project gets done, but it, it gets done without your, your support. Thank you. Uh, Colonel Roberts. Yes, very similar answer to Admiral Moynihan. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge that the Department of Defense, you know, we have a perspective on how we would like our, you know, films to appear and, and how we would like to be portrayed. But that is our perspective. Uh, it's equally important to acknowledge and respect um, artists uh, and filmmakers uh, and their perspective on how they would like to portray their own art. and. It may just, uh, as the Admiral said, it's a simple matter of we're not able to support things uh, outside of our right and left limits. 
of what we know um, to accurately portray us. But, you know, it's, it's a whole different conversation as to whether or not you'd asked earlier if we killed the project. I would say not to my knowledge ever. There are many projects died because they lacked funding or distribution. Um, some, uh, you know, admittedly, we, you know, wipe our brow and say, wow, that was, you know, it's a good thing that one didn't make it because it really wasn't a, a good portrayal. But there are others um, that are great projects that I see uh, time and time again that just can't quite get over the hump. They can't get that filming or distribution, or rather funding and distribution. Um, so all that to say, you know, to me, we don't own the, the, you know, every military story out there. We provide a perspective. I think it is the most credible and accurate perspective. But sometimes people just want to be entertained. Sometimes artists just want to make art for art's sake. Um, and that, that certainly has a place as well. Thank you very much. Uh, now, I have a two-part question. This is going to have to be the last one because uh, it, not only is it good, but we're running out of time. Um, it's from Frank W. Hunt. And I, I'm kind of carve up his question into two. It, it actually reads, what film or documentary is the best example of cooperation between Hollywood and the DOD? I think there's a two-parter there. You can ask the, that question about documentaries exclusively, and you can ask it about fictional films. So uh, I'll throw that out to everybody there. And in your opinion, um, which one do you think uh, kind of which which documentary and, and which fictional uh, 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 film kind of knocked it out of the park in your opinions with regard to that cooperation and, and the end product being a compelling and quality product? I mean, I'll, I'll jump on something. Um, in the documentary space, I would say Victory at Sea. You know, the that's a classic. It's it's the saga of the Navy in World War II, made with Navy cooperation, made with Hollywood uh, A-list talent, and it, it's something that holds up to this day. Yeah, it is outstanding. That's a great that's a great example. Denny, do you have one? I'll, I'll go on the movie front, and it's the the one that I know, and it's fairly recent, and that is uh, Captain Phillips. Uh, just the relentless attention to detail uh, to get it to getting it right and to portraying the Navy um, in the way that the Navy wanted to be portrayed. Um, that to me is the most recent great example of a movie where the Navy and the service were reflected well, and the producers on the other side just did a phenomenal job. Another great choice, yes. Colonel Roberts, top so that one. Go and, so, so it pains me as an Air Force guy to say this, but I will tell you that uh, I've got to pick the most, you know, iconic military movie of, you know, in pop culture in the last few decades, and that's Top Gun. I think, you know, the Navy does it right. I got to commend Russ Coons and his his team out there in Los Angeles, um, uh, Captain Russ Coons and his folks, just do a fantastic job. They they wrapped uh, Top Gun Maverick. The only reason that movie was able to be made was through the support of the Navy. And that was a two and a half year journey that they did. Um, you know, I wasn't, I was not a part of that. I came in afterwards, but it's amazing. Um, the amount of work in, in a two and a half year journey to get that film, uh, you know, to get that on film. And that, that's a movie that begs to be seen on the big screen. Um, and that will be coming out in June. Uh, it's been pushed back due to COVID, but um, I just think the Navy continues to do a fantastic job. I'm proud of all the services, the Air Force with Captain Marvel and some of the big blockbusters they've done, the Army with uh, 12 Strong, and, and I know they're working on three projects right now that are all very live, uh, true, true-to-life stories. Um, and so I just think that uh, for me, Top Gun is kind of, you know, so many people that have served in the last two and a half decades were influenced by that movie. Um, and I just think that, that that's a perfect example of collaboration between the Department of Defense and the entertainment realm. That's great. And I'll just uh, put in my quick two cents. Uh, no surprise, probably this one is probably picked very frequently as being one that's just ended up being a fantastic product. Saving Private Ryan. Uh, I, I think uh, it, the opening sequence alone uh, is gold in terms of that theme that was brought up earlier by David, uh, giving people that haven't served in this uh, uh, modern environment where you have a civilian military divide, 
uh, mm -hmm. a real feel for what the experience is like. Um, I, I, I remember reading stories of uh, veterans of World War II, both in the Pacific and in the European theater, saying they had to get up and leave before that sequence even ended because it was it brought it back so strongly. Um, so that's one. Um, another more recent one, I, I was really impressed with Greyhound, uh, the adaptation of the C.S. Forrester novel. Uh, a great portrayal of the amount of mental focus that you need in that kind of environment and the, the fact that there is no let up and there is no room for error. I think they did a fantastic job with that one. Um, all right, guys, uh, it is already past our time a little bit here. Um, I've really enjoyed this panel. Uh, you guys are fantastic. Uh, great input, um, great questions from all of uh, our viewers. Um, there were many more than we could possibly get to. So uh, I just want to remind everybody that uh, this, uh, you can review this, revisit this again uh, in about 24 hours at the same length that you were provided uh, to get here in the first place. And I'd also like to let everybody know, if, if you can just let me grab something, that there is uh, in eye rolls again, guys, here at the uh, end of the thing. Um, this is a double feature in, in a way. Um, about two weeks ago, I uh, recorded an interview with Heath Hardage Lee, who is the author of this book, The League of Wives, The Untold Story of the Women Who Took on the U.S. Government to Bring Their Husbands. It's a story of Sybil, Sybil Stockdale and others of the POW wives during the Vietnam War and League of Families of POWs and Missing in Southeast Asia and the incredible work they did. Uh, uh, not only countering North Vietnamese propaganda, but uh, goading the U.S. government into action on re in, in regard to their husbands. Um, this is being made into a, a motion picture as with a uh, as people have mentioned to me in email, uh, COVID's kind of thrown everybody, everything, a loop into everything. Uh, but it is in process, and it's uh, Reith Witherspoon's um, film company, Hello Sunshine, that's uh, working this one. So um, I interviewed Heath, it's a, it's, and she tells us, uh, gives us a background of that story, as well as some insight into that very difficult but challenging and also rewarding process that you guys have talked about here for the last hour, uh, generating a, a film script, in her case, from an entire book. Uh, but it's, uh, I, I encourage everybody to see that. You should see a link here pop up somewhere uh, to, uh, to that recorded interview. And uh, with that, I will say good, uh, goodbye to everybody and have a great day and please do uh, uh, enjoy the rest of the uh, um, today's events. And uh, Dave, Denny, and Glenn, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Dr. Baker. It was a pleasure.